isn't helping my meditation. <laughs> In this video, we're going to be investigating meditation, specifically mindfulness meditation. I'm curious to find out if we really should be all incorporating it into our everyday lives. What are the benefits of meditation and what's the evidence behind it? And more importantly, can we be doing it just from an app on our phones? Let's find out. Okay, back in the warmth. So what is mindfulness meditation? Well, it's a form of mental training where you focus non-judgmentally on present moment experiences, which may include sensations, thoughts, and emotions. And it's becoming increasingly popular, well, meditation generally. In fact, 80% of US medical schools are now including meditation-based interventions as part of their education, research, and training programs. And I think the reason for this increased popularity is probably twofold. First of all, we are busy seeking alternatives to traditional medications that have got less side effects, especially things like chronic pain when we've got this massive opioid epidemic. Secondly, patients are becoming more active and accountable for their own health, and meditation is something they can do themselves at home or wherever they want to do it. So what uses are there for meditation? I'll sit down for this bit. So, the uses for mindfulness meditation are long and include things such as helping with migraine, IBS, fibromyalgia, reducing cardiovascular risk, uh, substance misuse, smoking cessation, the list goes on. But the ones I'm going to talk about today are the two big ones, which are for stress reduction and for chronic pain. And also a little third one, which I think is really, really interesting, which is how it can actually affect your immune system. So a 2016 systematic review of more than 20 RCTs involving 1,600 participants found that mindfulness meditation can affect your immune system. It decreases uh, pro-inflammatory processes, it increases cell-mediated defense parameters, and it increases enzyme activity to guard against cell aging. So it actually helps prevent your cells from aging. We're talking about meditation. And if that's actually all true, then that would have a massive impact on things like viruses, cancer, um, type 2 diabetes, osteoporosis, and so on. So that's tentative in terms of evidence, but it's certainly really interesting and one to watch out for in the future. So let's talk a little bit more about how mindfulness meditation can help with chronic pain. There are masses of studies that look at the effects of meditation and chronic pain. We know that it can affect your expectations of impending pain, about your pain acceptance, quality of life, and functional status. And we know this isn't just in the short term whilst you're actually meditating. An interesting study on lower back pain found in a three-year follow-up that there was still sustained benefit. In fact, in the short term when you're meditating, um, meditation helps lower your pain intensity. It, in effect, closes the gate on the pain. But when you've been meditating for a much longer period of time, it has a different effect. It actually decreases the unpleasantness of the pain and you become able to separate the meaning of the pain from the sensory experience. And what that allows people to do is be better able to cope with the pain. And that has a huge impact for all the millions of people who have chronic pain and may mean that they're able to decrease the amount of medication they're taking that has nasty side effects. So we know that the evidence comes from patients telling us that they have decreased pain and the more meditation experience you have, the lower reported pain scores you have. But also, there affects your neural mechanisms and what this means is it actually changes your brain. So, over a period of time, you have decreased activation in the brain in the areas that are evaluating pain. And that is even true in a non-meditative state. So for experienced meditators, they might be making a cup of tea and the areas of the brain that, that evaluate pain are deactivated. I think that's pretty amazing. And thinking about how it affects your brain, we can think a little bit more about this when it comes to stress as well. So what is the link between stress and the brain and mindfulness meditation? Well, studies show that mindfulness meditation can actually change the structure and the function of the brain in the areas that are associated with attention, self-regulation, and emotion. We know that patients who have got moderate to severe stress do have changes in their brain. They have increased gray matter density within the amygdala and decreased gray matter density within the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex. And when mindfulness meditation is carried out, the opposite is then true. They've got decreases in the amygdala and increases in the hippocampus. And we know that it also affects what's called our parasympathetic nervous system, which is traditionally what we think of as our rest and digest. 
and can block what's called the sympathetic nervous system, which is what we think of as our fight and flight response. And our fight and flight response was really useful when we were hunter gatherers being chased by lions, but when we're just getting stressed about a mountain of emails to respond to, it's much less useful. So overall, there's excellent evidence that mindfulness meditation can affect, uh, beneficially affect stress, anxiety, and depression. So let's have a look overall, what is the evidence for meditation? How robust is the evidence? Well, there are a couple of key problems overall with the evidence with mindfulness meditation. First of all, a lot of the studies rely on patients self-reporting the results, which therefore means it's open to bias. The patients end up just saying what they think the researchers want to hear. Second of all, we know that mindfulness meditation is very open to the placebo effect, which is a hugely powerful effect and could explain the results. However, there was a really interesting study where they took patients and they had a control group, they had a placebo group, a mindfulness meditation group, and a sham mindfulness meditation group where people thought they were doing mindfulness meditation, actually they weren't, they were just doing kind of relaxation. And what they discovered was the mindfulness meditation group had significantly better effects at reducing pain than the other groups altogether. And this wasn't just in self-reporting, this was actually seen within neuroimaging in the brain. And however much you try and fool your brain into being biased, you will fail, that's pretty hard to do. So overall, it looks like there's something massive going on that's beyond just relaxation. Okay, now I just want to briefly touch upon if you can get all the benefits of mindfulness meditation from an app on your phone. I've been using the Headspace app um, just because someone recommended it to me. I'm not endorsing that one above any others. There are lots to choose from. And Headspace uh, give out lots of literature they think to suggest what benefits they've got of using the app. And that includes things like lowered aggression, lowered uh, mind wandering and increased focus, even lowered blood pressure. In cancer patients, they say it can uh, reduce distress and improve quality of life and so on. What I like about the Headspace app is that you can tailor it to whatever you want. So you can do one minute a day, two minutes a day, three minutes a day, and you can focus on which aspects you want to work on. And the reason I picked that one is because there's a really nice bit with kids. And um, I've been using it with my eight year old and she's been really enjoying it. There are special sleep modules, there are ones about being kind, so there's a lot to choose from. And even if you're scared of technology, you kind of just press play and put your phone down, so you're not really interacting with the technology, because I think a lot of people worry about that. So that is definitely one option, but some people prefer to go to a meditation class, so whatever works for you. But I think the app's worth a go if you're up for trying it. So my recommendation for you guys is just to do it. Just start, start small, just a minute, two minutes, three minutes a day, whatever you want to do. Once you start to understand the principles of it, you can practice it like I practice it when I'm waiting for the microwave to ping or I'm in a queue. And it is a skill to be practiced. It is called meditative practice. It's like learning the piano. It's gonna be hard at first and the more you do it, the more you enjoy it. I know some people say they're too busy to do it, but I think ultimately it makes us more efficient in our day-to-day -day lives. So I think it's easy to find time for it. And there are no side effects, not adverse side effects, only good side effects. So it's really worth trying. I'm not suggesting we're going to reach self-actualization and become Buddhist monks, but we may find ways to be better at managing stress, at managing pain. We may improve our immune systems, we may lower our blood pressure. So there's so many benefits to be had from just, just squeezing this in for a minute or two a day. Right, so that's everything on mindfulness meditation. I hope you really enjoyed it. I am a busy doctor and mum of three, so it takes a long time to do all this research and I've really enjoyed it and I hope you've enjoyed it and I've got loads more videos to come, so keep watching. Alright, thanks. Bye.